Hello, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this Taxpayers Alliance uh, webinar this afternoon with um, Mike Denham, our chairman, and our special guest this afternoon, Roger Bootle. Um, the topic of discussion today is, should we worry about the national debt? And there's been lots of interesting debate in the policy space about uh, modern monetary theory, low interest rates, helicopter money. It's all too good to be true, isn't it? Or maybe that um, maybe we're in different times now and the old economic rules no longer apply. Um, Mike and Roger will be discussing that and, and, and a lot more this afternoon. Um, and just to briefly introduce Roger, um, not that he needs much introduction, of course, but he's an economist um, uh, who founded the consultancy Capital Economics in 1999. Um, Roger and his team at Capital won the Wolfson Economics Prize in 2012 for the best plan for dealing with member states leaving the Eurozone. He's a weekly columnist at the Daily Telegraph, something I certainly myself count as a must read. And another must read, of course, is Roger's latest book, The AI Economy, which is available now at, on Amazon and all good bookshops, of course. And it looks at the economic questions posed by the age of the robot and examines coming changes to the way we educate, work and spend our leisure time. So please do pick that up. It's sure to be an absolute cracker, much like the rest of Roger's back catalogue. So without further ado, we'll get going and I'll hand over to our, uh, the TPA's chairman, Mike Denham, to start the discussion with Roger. Mike. Thanks very much, John. And uh, thank you, Roger, for sparing us some time today. I know you're very busy. You're always busy. Now, we saw in the budget that uh, debt as a proportion of GDP has ballooned to over 100% of GDP, and that's the highest level since the 1950s when we were still recovering from the Second World War. And it's also some way higher than what we got used to thinking of as being a safe upper limit for debt. So should we be worried about the national debt? How worried should we be? Our answer at the TPA is yes, particularly from the perspective of taxpayers. Um, but not everyone looks at it in the same way. And what I'd like to do today with you, Roger, is to get your views on how some of the people on what I might call the other side of the street, the people who are more relaxed about debt, are looking at this. And we can look around the world and we can see the huge fiscal spending package that's been launched by the Biden administration which seems to incorporate a lot of this sort of more optimistic thinking. And I fear there are people in our government who have a more um, relaxed uh, approach to debt. So I'm going to put to you some of their arguments. And I just want to stress for anyone watching this, these are not arguments necessarily the TPA would go along with, but I want to hear what Roger thinks about them. So let's start with the level of debt. And the people who are more relaxed would say something along the lines of, well, look, you know, 100% is quite a lot of debt, but it's by no means the highest level of debt we've had in our history, and we've managed to work through that before. There are other countries around the world that are quite successful that seem to have managed with higher levels of debt. Um, borrowing costs are a lot lower now, so we can afford to run with a higher level of debt. And also, if we look at the ballooning of debt over the last year or so, you know, a lot of that is down to pure and simple to COVID, a one-off emergency. And we can look at that as wartime debt. We can amortize it over the period of time. So why can't we just live with more debt and borrowing? Roger, in broad terms, what do you make of that argument? We'll come to some of the detail later. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and thanks for posing this fascinating question. And I'm going to give you an answer which you might think is typical for an economist, not, not typical for me. Um, rather frustrating answer, which is yes and no. Uh, now, you've expanded some of the arguments as to why we, sh we shouldn't be that worried about the debt, and I've myself been banging the drum on these in the Tory graph in my weekly column. As you say, we've had debt ratio higher than this. In fact, we've had a debt ratio higher than this over the last 250 years, more years than we've had a debt ratio lower than this. Um, in the years after the Second World War, uh, when we came out of that with a debt ratio 250% of GDP, uh, it was a struggle to work it down. I and mean, the interesting question is, were we burdened by that debt? Well, not if you look at the economic stats, we weren't, because this is the fastest sustained period of growth in our history. This is the period when we're saying you've never had it so good. And if you rightly say there are countries you can point to elsewhere in the world who are coping. 
perfectly well with a high level of debt. So that's, as it were, the no. But yes, we should be worried. Um, and I'm more worried about the deficit than I am about the debt in the sense that I think, you know, as you rightly say, you could look at it as something incurred to fund a war. It's there. It causes a few burdens and problems. But as long as it's not constantly going up, we can live with those and work it down over time. I'm more worried if we get ourselves into a position where there's a big continuing deficit, which it means, means of course, that the debt keeps going up. Um, and I am worried, uh, to some extent, about interest rates and the nonsense that's spouted called modern monetary theory. Um, you may know the quip about the Holy Roman Empire. I can't remember who said it, but someone said there are three things to remember about the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. Well, similarly, with modern monetary theory, it's not modern, it's not really monetary, and it's not a theory. Um, it's really a pile of illusions that you can always, so, someone said in the paper the other day, and said it wasn't me, you know, if money printing can get you out of all this, why is it that the history of the Roman Empire, the later Roman Empire, Zimbabwe and Venezuela, et cetera, weren't different? Why am I Germany? <laughs> we know, don't we, in our bones, that this can't be a free pass to get out of all that. Um, I'll stop banging on that, but sorry to have given you this balance. Uh, answer. And I suppose relating to both the yes and the no, I would be probably more worried if I thought governments were going to be so concerned to get the debt ratio down uh, that they were going to jack up tax rates. That would cause me an awful lot of worry. I'd rather live with the debt, thank you very much, to keep the taxes down. Um, and I think the bigger question than all of this, you should be worried about the debt ratio, is a question which goes right to your bread and butter, as it were, the appropriate level of government spending in the economy, and therefore, given that we can't print money, therefore the rate of taxation. And that's what worries me about all this, that we're getting ourselves into a time and a period instead of attitudes, where this government, a conservative government, used to spreading money around, just thinks, well, so what? It doesn't matter, because somehow it doesn't quite understand or accept that in the end that implies higher taxes. Thank you for that, Roger. We'll probe into some of the detail on that. But so, so you know, you, you're not the one handed economist that uh, we were after, but, but there we are. Um, so uh, moving on to some of the detail and some of the argu other arguments that are flying around. There's the coiled spring argument, the argument that, yes, OK, the OBR's budget forecast looks pretty catastrophic. But, you know, actually, they're probably underestimating the strength at which the economy is going to bounce back after lockdown once we unlock. And the coiled spring will let itself go, will get more growth, much more tax revenue. And therefore, we, you know, the, the situation that we're looking at in the budget projections is too pessimistic. And Rishi may very well not have to actually implement these tax rises that he's set out. What, what do you make of that? I agree with it. Um, oh, there you are. There's a one handed answer. Um, I agree with it. Well, no one knows, but it, it does amuse me in a way, given that um, I'm, I'm well versed in the inaccuracies of economics. Uh, it amuses me the way that the OBR's prognostications are taken so seriously when they come out with them. I mean, like the rest of us, they haven't really got a clue. This is just guesswork. Um, but I, I'm, I've said in some of my articles, put forward some arguments as to why I think they're being too pessimistic. In particular, this is unlike a normal recession. I mean, given that there was a big drop in output, depression levels of a drop in output, thanks to the furlough scheme, of course, there's been very little uh, forced unemployment. Um, and accordingly, I suspect that the scarring is going to be minimal. I also think that there are going to be some benefits, some efficiency benefits for, for business to come out of it all. So yeah, my central view would be more like the OBR's optimistic view. It is like a coiled spring. We're going to bounce back very strongly. And I suspect the potential output level in the economy is higher than the OBR uh, thinks. And the result of that is going to be we're going to eliminate the deficit sooner and easier and without the need for tax rights. Then we get into the sorts of issues I was raising before. That's all very well. But is the government going to stop spending money? Uh, uh, and then, because if they don't, then we, despite the fact that the economy is a problem spring, we then still end up with higher taxes. Well, that's a very clear answer, Roger. Uh, so we appreciate that. Before I ask you the next uh, question, can I just mention that um, for our viewers today, 
there is a Q&A facility here. And when Roger and I have finished speaking, um, John will take back the, uh, the, the controls and he will put some of your questions to, uh, to Roger. And on your screen, you will see a Q&A button towards the bottom right. So you can press that, you can feed your questions in and uh, John will pick them up later in the session. Okay, um, so, all right, so, so you think that actually the, um, the, the, the optimists in terms of the short term, in terms of the rebound of the economy are probably right. And, and I think I'd probably possibly be inclined to agree with you on that. But let's now go on to borrowing costs. I mean, at the moment, borrowing costs are still quite low by historic levels. I mean, we have seen a backup in bond yields over the course of the last couple of months. But I mean, frankly, all that's happened is it's gone back to pretty well where they were before we had the mm. COVID crisis. So, you know, it's not, it's not really changed the big picture. Now, at the moment, 3% of government receipts uh, actually goes in debt interest payments, which is quite a low level compared to history. Yep. If you go back to the 80s, it got up to over 10%, and that was a serious problem. But 3%, you know, that's not so bad. And even after the recent increases, bond yields remain very low. Now, there are plenty of people who argue that bond yields are likely to remain very low. Borrowing costs are likely to remain very low because the structure of the world economy has changed. And, you know, the globalization of the economy and the financial markets, the entry into the world economy of some big new economies in the East with very high savings ratios because they've got, they, they've got um, demographics that really younger people, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so this is actually something that's going on for the long term. In fact, I've seen one research report, and you've probably seen the same research report, that says that real interest rates have been in a long-term downtrend since about the 15th century. And so actually, you know, there's nothing to worry about. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, I can't comment on the 15th century, but I would caution um, you and anyone else who reads that stuff on the quality of the data. Um, yeah, well, I've been one of those economists who very much have been in the camp of saying, look, there's a structural change in the economy. And I published what is probably my best known book, The Death of Inflation in 1996. And I followed that up later on with other things and books that were arguing that the world economy is fundamentally different and we're set for a very, very long period of extremely low interest rates. I forecast 2%, but I think I said 20 years at one point, which was thought to be totally bonkers. Of course, I, everything economists say they proved to be wrong, but I mean, they proved to be wrong in the wrong direction. That's to say we end up much lower. Um, so that's most, the background of me is where I'm coming from, as it were, the stable I'm from. Um, but I, I think things are changing, and I don't think those arguments are going to apply in the same way over the next 10, 15, 20 years as they have over the last, what is it, quarter of a century or so. Um, people do, I think, get themselves in a bit of a mess by not knowing their history. Um, and I've, even though I'm not totally ancient and past it, I've lived through quite a few changes of monetary regime. And the thing that amuses me is in every one, uh, particularly the young people, but I would tend to say everyone, seems to think this is God-given and, and immutable. <laughs> they don't get their mind around the idea that it's limited by circumstance. I've seen several of these switches. I mean, I remember the 60s, before inflation took off and interest rates took off. The level of rates we eventually saw would have been absolutely unthinkable. I also remember working in the gilt market, by the way, when war loan yielded more than 18%. And there were plenty of people at the time who were bearish about it. They thought it was going above 20, right? So that's the background. Now, I, I think um, a number of things are changing. For a start, um, there's a bit of a sort of a wearing out of some of the big factors that were so important over the last quarter century. I mean, the rise of China and the entry to the world system, it's not gonna stop. I don't think it's gonna go into reverse, but it's not gonna have anything like, oh, it's not gonna, continue at the same rate that it happened before because China's growing more slowly. It already is substantially integrated into the world economy. You don't repeat that shock. And of course, there are some threats to that as well as countries become more conscious about security of supply, there are protection rising and so on and so forth. So I don't think that is quite the influence that it was. Uh, similarly, within domestic economies, although there are still some 
forces that are making for increased competition and lower costs. Again, this is nothing quite like the shock that we went through in the West at the same, more or less the same time as globalization. That's to say the breakdown of trade union power, privatization, all those things blurring the boundaries between different providers and the intensification of competition. I think all those, have, they, they're not getting gone, but they pretty much played themselves out, I think. And then on the other side, there are some influences strongly in the other direction. On the supply side, there's a change in the global demographics. Economists Goodhart and Pradaj have written a very good new book, I can't remember the name of it, um, arguing that the last quarter century was really driven by a one-off demographic surge, which is partly linked to birth rates and partly linked to China and other countries coming into the world system. And now it's going into reverse. And they forecast the return of higher inflation. Then, of course, you've got this massive fiscal stimulus in so many countries, and in quite a few countries, including ours, enormous amounts of pent up money. I mean, the rate of increase of the money supply, and I'm no monetary, in Britain and America and most other countries has been spectacular recently. Now, some people say, unfortunately, the money is held by the wrong people, let's say people like you and me, who aren't going to spend it. Well, I don't agree with that because certainly when I'm allowed out back into the wild, you're not going to get me out of the pub, restaurant, cinema, theatre, or whatever for months to come. I'll have to be forcibly dragged out. And that's true of all my friends who are champing at the bit. So I think there's going to be a splurge for all those reasons. Now, the whole point about this, to come to your question about interest rates, um, I think inflation in the medium term is on the way back. Now, it's not going to be this year. I mean, at the moment, there's going to be a in the next few months, probably an upward move for technical reasons, and it may get up to 2% or so, but that's not the question. The question is the bigger issue connected with the things I've just been talking about. And in the medium term, I expect inflation to return as a problem. And when it does, what is the Bank of England and other central banks going to do about it? And broadly speaking, they've got two choices. They can either accept it, which has certain attractions, uh, real interest rates are negative. People might argue that boosts economic growth, diminishes the real value of government debt, blah, 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 blah. Also got some problems attached to it, of course. Uh, they either accept it or they try to fight it. And if they try to fight it, they're almost certainly going to have to impose higher interest rates. And when they impose higher interest rates, that's, of course, going to increase the cost of government finance at the short end. And it's going to drive up guilt yields. So I very much am in the camp that um, there is a really very significant prospect in the medium term of much higher interest rates and bond yields. Yes, I think uh, um, I, I understand completely what you're saying there. I mean, to, to open up, well, let, let, let's talk about mod, mod, modern monetary theory again. I mean, as you described, it's like the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. But, you know, there are quite a lot of people around who still seem to think that, you know, because inflation has been so quiescent for a long time, and I mean, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you, I expected inflation to be more of a problem after the initial wave of QE, let alone now. Mm. But, you know, we have had this enormous expansion in uh, central bank balance sheets and the creation of central bank money, um, which could obviously spill over, but it hasn't spilled over yet. So are we saying that, I mean, when, when you talk about the medium term, I, I, are you thinking about sort of 10 years, 20 years? I mean, how long is this going to take? No, I'm talking, I mean, by, by the short term, I typically mean up to two years. I'm talking beyond that. I don't know, three years, four years, five years. That's the sort of scenario, the time frame in which I think we will see inflation coming back. Yes, you're right about QE, but the circumstances were really very, very different. Uh, I said earlier, I'm not a monetarist. I'm, by training and inclination of Keynesian, and that means I pay attention to a lot of forces that determine spending above and beyond the money supply, including, of course, fiscal policy. And it's the fiscal response that's so different this time. You know, when QE first came in in the wake of the, I say first came in, called that, of course, I mean, in the old days, in the 30s, and Keynes was banging on about this, it used to be called open market operations, funny enough. Um, but anyway, um, when QE, so-called, first came in after the global financial crisis 2007-09, the big difference then is that after the initial relaxation of fiscal policy to try and absorb some of the shock, fiscal policy was tightened. So all this money was money pumped in by the central banks into the markets 
landing up on the deposits of the banks who weren't inclined to do anything with it. The economy was flat on its back. But they've um, they suffered all sorts of losses. They were constrained by all sorts of uh, restraints imposed by governments and central banks. So the money just sat there. It you know, didn't really get out of the financial monetary ambit. This is quite different because you've got these huge budget deficits, 18% in the UK of the last year, 16% in America. So the money that's pumped in courtesy of QE lands up in the bank deposits of ordinary people and companies. And I think their spending reaction is going to be rather different. Yeah. And I mean, just very quickly, uh, you mentioned the issue of inflation actually helping the public finances. I mean, you hear this argument quite a bit and I've heard it said, well, you know, Rishi Sunak has actually lined things up. You know, he's frozen public sector wages, except for the nurses. He has frozen tax thresholds. You know, he's after a bit of he's after a bit of fiscal drag. You know, like Jeffrey Howard, for those of us old enough back in, in 1981, um, you know, a, a bit there. of a bit of, uh, yeah, I was there as well, a bit of fiscal drag. And, you know, so therefore, um, you know, actually a bit of inflation, as long as it doesn't get out of control, will help the public finances. You so, you, you sounded very sceptical about that, Roger, earlier. Well, no, I think it would, a little bit of inflation. It would help the public finances a lot less now than it used to, of course, because we've got uh, index-linked debt, which we didn't used to have in the good stroke bad old days. So that part of public finances reacts badly um yeah in the short term i think it can do some good but as i said earlier on you know if inflation money creation was the answer to a maiden's prayer then why venezuela why the weimar republic why diocletian's rome you know it doesn't tend to work out that well in the end i mean one of the problems is how do you keep inflation from picking up now, i wouldn't in totally beyond the comfortable level i wouldn't totally give up on this but I mean, the riposte, I think, one of the riposte of what you've said is, you know, having a little bit of inflation is a bit like opting to be a little bit pregnant. Um, you can't actually call a halt. The process takes over. That's what they say. Actually, I'm not completely convinced by that because after the Korean War, and uh, I don't know about you, but I wasn't there for that, um, inflation in the UK and in most of the developed West was fairly stable. Um, I'm going to take a stab at it now, but from the end of the Korean War to 67, which was a devaluation, I would guess in the UK it's about 3%, something like that. Sometimes lower, sometimes a little bit higher. Um, and it showed no marked tendency to increase. Now, if the authorities here could have 3% inflation for a number of years, would they be appalled or would they welcome it? I think they'd welcome it, is my guess. And I don't think they'd be alone either. No, I think that's probably right. It sort of oils the wheels. It would get us away from that whole discussion of having to have negative interest rates and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I, I, I think you're probably right. Um, anyway, moving, moving on. Um, so, I mean, I hear what you say about the uh, current debt and how you mm -hmm. think that, um, you know, the recovery is going to be a bit stronger. But if we need to do some fiscal consolidation, you know, how is the, how we, how, what is the best way of doing that? What is the right mix of tax increases and spending cuts? I mean, the coalition, when it came to power back in 2010, and you've already touched on this, I mean, they adopted an 80-20 strategy. Mm -hmm. They were faced with a fiscal situation that uh, there were some differences, but they also had to, had to face a situation where they were borrowing far too much, too much debt building up. And they said that they were going to consolidate the public finances with an 80-20 mix, 80% 80 of it was going to come from spending cuts and 20% was going to come from tax increases. But if you look at Rishi's uh, budget, um, he's actually flipped it around the other way. I mean, not 80-20, but the bulk of the adjustment, the bulk of the consolidation that he's got planned at any rate is coming from uh, tax increases, especially corporation tax. Now, was he right? And what I, said, I think I probably know the answer to that, Roger, but what, what would be, the, in your opinion, the right sort of balance to strike right now? Mm. Well, I'm tempted to say 100 to zero. Um, I think you know which way. Um, I understand why uh, Rishi Sunak did what he did. I mean, I think a lot of this is, frankly, it's politics. Um, 
And as I indicated earlier on, I'm hopeful that he won't actually need to push through with these tax rises. It's quite interesting because he announced them, but they aren't biting for quite some while. And I thought that was quite clever in a way, because if the OBR plans turns out to be wrong and the optimists turn out to be right, then he hasn't got, actually got to go ahead with it. Um, and I'm hoping very much that he won't. But this whole area, you can't give an objective answer to it, really, because it is all, so much is about politics and about your preferences, as well as your beliefs, I suppose, about the way the system works and how it's structured. I continue to believe that there's massive waste in the public sector, absolutely huge waste in the public sector. And that in general, people are the best judges of their own interests and they spend their money better than government spend it on their behalf. Now, having said that, um, you know, there are public goods and there are a number of spheres in which we need governments to spend money on our behalf. And I'm all in favor of that. One of the tragedies of not just this latest round after the, under the coalition, but it's true, I think, in British governments for 50 or 60 years or more, when they're faced with the need to cut, they cut all the wrong things. I mean, one of the easiest things to cut, of course, is public investment. Um, it doesn't have any votes attached to it immediately. Um, and so you slash that, which is exactly, of course, what they, in general, should not be cutting. Although there are some sorts of public investment, which I would um, lop off straight away. I mean, HS2, for instance, you know, if I were Treasury Mandarin in charge of all this, and someone said to me, right, say, when it says how many billions, Boodle, I'd immediately cancel HS2. Then there are other things, but again, they come to these political questions, depends what sort of society you live in and you know what weight you put on fairness and unfairness and who you think is being treated unfairly, but I would end the triple lock on pensions, which I think is crazy. Um, but we have to come to terms with the big spenders. We have to come to terms with the NHS, and good luck, luck with that one in the current climate. And I've got, um, I've got quite a lot of personal experience of the NHS. Uh, and I, I think actually it's a difficult, it's a bit like debt. You can't give, in my view, um, a straightforward one-handed economist's view to it. I had COVID in January and was taken to hospital. And uh, fortunately it wasn't serious. Although those of you listening may suggest I may still be suffering from long COVID, isn't it? Um, and um, I was full of admiration for the clinical care that I've received, and I've, I've had this in various other brushes with the NHS. But goodness gracious me, the bureaucracy, the lack of communication, you know, one nurse coming in giving this, and the other nurse coming half an hour later thinking I hadn't been given it and trying to give me something else, and this goes on and on and on. Um, and from my experiences, this is, um, it's terrifying. It's got some very good aspects to it, say, so on the whole, first rate. Thing. Yeah, but it's a massive leviathan saddled with ludicrous amounts of bureaucracy and I think it wastes huge amounts of money. So you'd have to tackle that. I think you'd have to redesign the social security system in order to, you know, if you wanted to make room for either lower borrowing or, or tax cuts. And this government hasn't got the appetite for it. So instead, the great danger, I think, is if someone like me comes along and says, oh, you, right, you know, the balance between these things has got to be heavily in favour of cutting spending, the way these things work is it'll be the wrong things that'll be cut, <laughs> sadly. Well, I mean, that, that takes, takes us on to the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, about the longer term. You know, we've all seen, I'm sure, the OBR's fiscal sustainability report, their long-term projections of what's going to happen to the public finances yeah. on unchanged policies. And, you know, the, every time they produce one, they do it every couple of years, and every time they produce one, the picture seems to look worse and worse. And, um, you know, the latest one, I was looking at the numbers the other day, they have a range of scenarios that go out for 50 years. And all right, we all know that long term projections are very, very difficult. And, you know, one should never, you know, forecast particularly about the future. We know all of that. But they're putting together a perfectly credible set of projections based on conventional assumptions and so on. And what they show is that on their central projection, uh, public sector debt increases to over 400% of GDP, and the um, debt interest costs as a proportion of government receipts increase to nearly half. Now, obviously, this is simply not a sustainable situation. Right. Something has to give. And I think you've already given us a pretty good flavor of the kind of things that uh, 
that, that, that you would like to see give. But let, let me put a let me put a contrary. Uh, oh, and by the way, I think that on health, um, you know, you're, you're right. I mean, I'm sorry to hear you had COVID. I mean, the NHS, the people at the sharp end, I think we've all had excellent experiences with them. It's about the system. And we might and we might come back to that in a moment. But um, so, I mean, you know, looking forward, um, there are people who say, well, all right, spending is going to increase, you know, but the reason those OBR forecasts look so bad is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to deliver, um, you know, spending on the back of, they usually say US style uh, taxation. And, you know, the obvious solution to this is to increase the tax level because we've got European um, uh, neighbors who have much higher levels of taxation than, than we do. And they seem to be okay. I mean, look at per capita income, look at Sweden. I mean, they're richer than we are and they've got much higher levels. Of, so, I mean, why, why, why can't we go down that sort of route? Or, or, or well, I was going to ask you a more general question. How do you think we should tackle the, um, the, the that long-term unsustainability? But I think you've already given us a pretty good indication. Mm. But perhaps you could tell us why you think we couldn't go down that Swedish route. Well, I think potentially we could. Um, I think we could. There is a real choice. And uh, it may well be that, that tackling it that way might fit in with your agenda for reducing inequality in this society. Now, personally, for a variety of reasons, that doesn't appeal to me, um, but it will appeal to some people. I think it is an option. It's a genuine subject for debate. I must say I'm wary of taking Sweden as an example. It's such a different country from us. It really is. It's much smaller, of course, as a society and as an economy. I mean, I remember when, in the days when getting on top of inflation was apparently a huge, huge challenge. Various economists kept banging on about the Swedish model where you get all the unions and companies together in a room and bash it all out, you know, social consensus and so on and so forth. Um, well, it might work in Sweden, uh, but I'm not convinced it's going to work here. Sweden is a very, very, very different society indeed. And of course, there are lots of counter examples of countries with which we are in direct competition, operating with um, much lower and simpler uh, tax systems. Now, of course, Hong Kong is stymied by other factors at the moment, and I'm not very optimistic about its future. But historically, of course, it's operated with a very low tax rate, as indeed as Singapore. These can not to mention the various countries in the Middle East with which we're in competition financially for our financial services sector. Um, you can take this too far. Uh, I, I don't think you need to be rock bottom of the uh, the league, if you like, for tax rates. I've always thought that it, we should be aiming for a tax rate where the main players are not that much bothered about paying it or not paying it or avoiding it or evading it or whatever. Now, can we debate what that is? Um, but personally, I think it's around about 20%. Um, I mean, I don't mind paying 20% capital gains on whatever it is I have to pay tax on, I really do mind paying 45%, never mind rates above 50% that we've seen and some people are paying now. I and mean, I think that is a massive disincentive and distortion. Um, and of course, if there is that disincentive and distortion, and again, that's why I'm so nervous about the Swedish example, because I don't think they are in the competition in the same way that we are with Singapore and Dubai and the United States and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, if you are in the competition and you go with very high tax rates, that's all very well. You may think you've squared the circle that way, but it may turn out that you haven't because you've so diminished your long-term growth rate that you actually worsen the competition. You have to tackle it either by jacking rates up even higher or tackling it some other way. Now, the second part of your question is how will this whole thing be tackled? And you're right, of course, to be skeptical about what a 50-year projection might suggest. I've indicated to some extent what I would do. For a start, the current system of social security, including pensions, is unaffordable, not fit for purpose. The NHS is not fit for purpose. I think the notion of free at the point of use, I think that has to go. Uh, we have to have a system where the state does provide ultimate protection for people. Actually, the route I would go down, um, is hiving off bits of the NHS. I mean, it, doesn't, it seems to me you don't need the same system for sort of 
care of chronic cancer and serious illness as you do for an ingrowing toenail. I mean, that's one quite interesting, really. I mean, opticians aren't uh, any longer nationalized. They were effectively controlled, weren't they? Uh, dentists, because of the peculiarity of the settlement that was made under the Labour government in the post-war period, I know there are NHS dentists, but there aren't that many, and there are fewer and fewer of them. Dentistry is primarily in the private sector. That's the route I would take, actually. I would try and find ways of hiving off more and more of the NHS into the private sector while preserving the central idea that if someone falls seriously or, you know, serious injury or whatever, they will not be bankrupted by that or you know, left to die because they can't afford it. The state's going to carry that out. But I don't think that means that, you know, everything, every single medical ailment has to be covered. I, th I think that's probably right. I mean, of course, you know, when we look at our NHS, it is always said, well, it's a universal system, you know, and if you go down some of these other routes, you end up with, with bits and pieces, and, and, and what you're saying would, would probably provoke this argument, you know, bits and pieces that are essentially privatised, like dentistry, mm -hmm. and poor people won't be able to afford those things. Now, there are systems on the continent, and we don't want to spend a lot of time talking about health, the alternative mm -hmm. health systems, but of course there are social insurance type systems yeah. on, the, on the continent, where, which seem to combine some element of choice and competition with universality. So, yeah. you know, the people always try and people who oppose serious NHS reform, as, as we know, always try and push it off and say, well, you'll end up with the US system. That's right. But, but, but I mean, there are, there, are, there are alternatives here for sure. And I mean, I, my view is very much in line with yours that, and, and the TPA's view, as you would expect, is you know, we, we cannot really tackle the longer term spending problem, and we characterize it as primarily a spending problem without actually getting stuck into some of these big structural issues like on healthcare, and as you say, the triple lock and so on. That you know, we we can we must have a proper discussion about that and not just shunt the words around, but actually make some decisions. And that brings me to another question, uh, which is really the key question. I think you already sort of referred to this, which is. How do we actually get these here today, gone tomorrow politicians to take these issues seriously? Um, you know, when, when they're going to be out of office long before that OBR's fiscal mm. sustainability problem comes home to roost. I mean, for example, are fiscal rules of any use? I mean, Gordon Brown introduced them, and you know, we would person that we, we ourselves would like to see um, uh, Boris's government actually implement some new, at least fiscal, some clear statements of where they're trying to head fiscally, like a target for debt to GDP ratio, for example. I mean, what's your view on this? Are these fiscal rules any use at all? And if so, how do we give them some credibility so that politicians actually have to take some notice of them? I think they are of some use. Um, I, I would compare them a bit like with them, um, with battle plans. I can't remember who has said that no battle plan survived the first contact with the enemy. Um, I think that's right, because things, things develop in a not large unpredictable way. But nevertheless, you do well to have one, rather than you know just entering into the fray, not knowing where you're going or what you're doing, who's attacking whom. Um, I think they are useful. And I would like to see something along the lines you suggest, but something that would go much further. That's to say, I'd like to see a forward plan for the tax system. Uh, which wouldn't be, as it were, binding targets, but at least a set of objectives. Um, the government is not in a position yet, I think ideologically or politically, to be able to tackle this. But this debate we've been having between us, this discussion about, you know, what's the appropriate rate of tax, general rate of tax, what's the appropriate size of government spending in the economy and all the rest of it. I would like us to have that debate, or the Conservatives to have it, presumably Labour would be having a different debate, and to come to a conclusion um, and then set out medium term objectives as to where we want to be. We all know you're going to be blown off course by things like COVID and heaven knows what else. Instead of which, what happens is we have these crises um, and typically we haven't thought through what should happen to spending. We haven't thought, thought through what the upper limit to tax is. And so generally, the first thing to go is borrowing. Of course, that takes the strain. And then when we think that borrowing is getting too high or it might get too high, the next thing to take the strain is tax <laughs> uh, rather than, than spending, although the coalition government reversed that. And of course, they did cut spending. 
Uh, but I think we've got to have that debate properly. Um, I, I said that I don't think now's the, quite the right time politically. It'll be interesting to see what happens once we're through COVID and people reflect on the NHS, um, which in many ways has done a marvellous job, but in other ways it's done a terrible job. You know, it's a, um, now, of course, more recently, we've been clapping ourselves on the back and saying, um, we've been wonderful with the vaccine, which we have. Of course, that's not only about the NHS, it's about a bunch of volunteers, it's about scientists. In my case, I had my jab from someone who was an army medic, but actually now an RAF medic. Um, we've done well on that. But I don't think the NHS did really very well in the early stages of the pandemic. And of course, the government didn't do very well dealing with it. What about institutions like Public Health England? Um, and I got some really horrific scare stories about that. I mean, they seem to have been spending most of the last few years uh, trying to tell us, you know, how big the pizzas are that we should be safe to eat, you know, or how many units of alcohol or whatever, rather than planning effectively for the next pandemic, even though lots of experts have been suggesting that this was a big danger coming up in the, in the left. Um, I'm just wondering whether Perhaps in a year or two's time, the British public will have reached a level of maturity and distance from all this to be able to have this debate. And the NHS is central to this. I think you probably won't be able to get very far with controlling spending in total unless you buy this bullet, I suspect. I think that I think that sounds right. So, I mean, to pull all this together, Roger, before I hand you back to um, to John to take some questions from from the viewers. Um, I mean. How worried should we be? I mean, I'm not going to ask you on a scale of naught to 10, but I mean, you know, how, should we be worried? Are we in a worse position than we were after the 2008 financial crash because we haven't tackled some of these longer term problems yet and the clock has been ticking? I mean, you, you, sound quite, you sounded earlier quite optimistic about the rebound in the economy in the short term. And, you know, you, you, you're a great optimist, Roger, if you don't mind me saying so. I've got a, I'm sitting here in my study and I've got a few of your books on, on the shelf and you, and you, and you, and you always paint the, the optimistic picture, which is great. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, are, are we in a worse position now because, because we, we put off some of these issues? I used to be thought of a super bear, by the way, when I worked in the gilts market in the early 80s. But anyway. Well, um, you always seem to me to be an optimist. So maybe as you've got older. You... <laughs> um, yeah, I am relatively optimistic about it. Um, I, I think I've made myself fairly clear about what I'm worried about. I'm worried that we'll end up with much higher tax rates. And we'll end up with much higher tax rates because I think the government won't get to grips with these things. I was initially worried that they might be taken in by the, oh, goodness me, this debt is so huge. You will have to get it down by reducing the deficit through a process of fiscal tightening. I think we've largely avoided that danger. I don't think Rishi is likely to fall for that one. He realizes it could be counterproductive and you need to be patient about bringing the debt down. It can be, come down, I think, fairly easily. But I mean, all the political lessons that the government seems to have drawn from all this are, I'm afraid, the unhelpful ones. Boris, we know, is a natural spender. He's a believer in big projects. Um, and after all, you know, what is the zeitgeist? It is that you need public action, publicly funded action. This is what people need in order to survive safely in the society to function. So I'm rather worried that we're entering a period when uh, spending is going to be difficult to restrain and accordingly their inclination will be to put up taxes not i think to come on top of the deficit won't be necessary but to fund the increased spending that that sounds entirely plausible to me and very worrying and it's why we in the tpa are very worried about this as well we have to somehow find a way of getting a grip on spending but at that point roger thank you very much i'm going to hand back to john now is going to fire you a few other questions. John. Thank you, Mike, and um, thanks, Roger, as well, for such a fascinating discussion. Um, a great question in from um, a viewer, John, a namesake, who's asked about um, the discussion you and Mike were having about Sweden. He poses the question, isn't Denmark a better model in that they seem to combine a very sort of flexible labour market with low barriers to hiring and firing? 
um, quite high levels of social provision, for instance, and uh, uh, you know, on the flip side of that, some private provision of services too. Um, John's question is, are we mature enough for this? Or if we moved in that direction, will we just end up with the cost of the higher benefits without the balancing flexibility? Yeah, I don't know enough about the Danish economy in detail, I'm afraid to be able to answer that properly. But I think it falls into the same category. Denmark is an even smaller economy than Sweden, of course, much smaller geographically, it's got a smaller population. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to use Denmark as a model for a, a big country like ours, frankly. It's far easier to manage a country like Denmark. It's far easier to gain social and political consensus. Um, but I indicated earlier, um, if we want to go down the route of having a more comprehensive benefit system, being more generous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and paying for all that through tax, that is open to us. Uh, I'm not of that view, and I'm worried about what the consequences would be for us in terms of our, our growth rate. But uh, it is certainly the case that it's a possible avenue. And I think people on my side of the debate, and I guess your side of the debate, if I can bring us together on this, I think too easily dismiss this. We do disservice to people who are on the other side. We say that you know the evidence is overwhelming, that high tax economies do badly. Well, I don't think it is quite <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, there's quite a bit of evidence that it's true, and there's certainly a number of low tax economies that do very well, but there are these counter examples, and Sweden and Denmark will be some of them. I mean, France is an interesting one. I mean, I've written the same article on this several times in my career, but I don't see still another one coming on very shortly, uh, which is essentially, why is France doing so well? And when I write it, people write me, oh, what do you mean doing so well? Don't you mean badly? No, I mean well. Now, I know they're not doing that well, you know, they're not uh, Singapore or whatever, or Switzerland, but I mean, you can just go through the, the policies that they, you know, have a huge public sector, you know, public expenditure taking 60% of GDP, you know, they intervene left, right, and center, blah, blah, blah. Why aren't they bankrupt? And they're not. I mean, you know, they're not that bad. If you look at GDP growth over the last 30, 40 years, they do pretty well by and large. Um, uh, I can give a complicated answer to that question, but now that's an interesting. Another example of a country, I'd be more inclined actually to take France as an example than Sweden or Denmark because of size. Now, I think though you can see the signs of things cracking in France. I mean, just to give you a flavor of my explanation for the French paradox, I think you can do things in all sorts of peculiar ways for a length of time if you bottle up a society and control it, and it looks as though things are fine. And then comes the explosion, the breakout. It happened with the Soviet Union, when remember for until very late on in the post-war period, the Americans were paranoid that the Soviet Union was overtaking us and then the West. And the truth of the matter is, of course, underneath it all, it was cracking, you just couldn't quite see. And I think this is true of France as well. It's got great natural advantages, France, and I think its ruling elite is very capable and in its efforts to promote the French interest is sort of pretty clever and all the rest of it. But you can see, the cracks. I mean, I think the immigration stroke immigration figures are very interesting. You know that there are roughly the same number of Brits living in France as there are French people living in Britain. The difference is the Brits living in France are nearly all old and retired, and the French living in Britain are nearly all young and employed. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, what migration flows are a very interesting commentary on what's happening to a country. Um, but I mean, it, you, you think about it, you know, why isn't France the basket case that I think it should be, given the policies that it's operated. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. And um, I, I suppose a weirdly tangentially linked question in that um, with France, perhaps, you know, not, not performing as badly as it so as it should, according to the numbers, it, do you think that that feeds into a sense that we don't really need to worry about this stuff among the general public? And um, uh, do we need to sort of create a sense of urgency among the general public about these about these issues? Or, or do you think that they're, people are just quite relaxed and sanguine about it because they can see things aren't all, all that bad elsewhere? Yeah. Well, I don't think the public should be panicked about it. And in the end, of course, they've got a choice to make. The trouble is, I think that they're usually not very well informed about the choice. And the fault isn't so much theirs as those people who are talking to them. Um, the shame you can't, as it were, do a meaningful vote on this and then implement the answer. I mean, you know, what sacrifices are you prepared to make 
to get the growth of GDP per capita in this country to 3%. It would be nice to ask that question and get an educated answer, see what people are interested in. In principle, of course, people do want their living standards to improve, don't they? Um, and in America, this has been more of an issue than it has been in British case because other well, things have changed a bit recently. The median US post-tax real income for a long point didn't move, didn't increase for about 15, 20 years at some point, really, it actually fell. So there was a great crisis in America about, um, about living standards and how on earth the American economy was going to be brought to perform better. We never had that quite in this country because we never had that squeeze on median earnings for a variety of reasons. We never had it. Um, so there, there's also, of course, there's this great um, gathering of opinion that doesn't want economic growth, doesn't want to be richer. Um, the whole woke brigade that thinks this is all terribly bad for the environment and everything else, who wants to be richer, better off, we don't need it. That is a problem in getting an intelligent um, debate about these questions. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, if people do want, and I think on balance, in general, on average, they do want to have decent increases, improvements in their real living standards, then that's going to mean getting the economy to perform better. Uh, and that's going to demand all sorts of changes and policies, including, I think, with regard to tax. Uh, and I just wish, so that, in that sense, yes, I do think people ought to be bothered about this it's, because it does touch on something that I think on balance they do think is important. But unfortunately, often they don't see the connection. They see that their you know, pay isn't going up by very much in relation to prices going up in the shops. They wish things were different. But they don't necessarily make the connection between that and the key policies that the government is or is not operating. Mm, yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and a very final sort of quick fire question, if you will, public sector pensions, which are... Mm. Um, off balance sheet, to, mm. to to use a lazy phrase. Um, again, should we be more worried about the the liabilities of public sector pensions going into the future, or is it something we can manage? Um, well, I guess the devil's in the detail, isn't it? Um, I haven't looked at it in detail for some while. Again, I, I wouldn't panic, but I think concern is the right attitude, and there's something more specific I'll come on to in a moment. And the people often say, oh, you know, it's off balance sheet. If you add in the present value of the public sector pensions, then we're down the tube, blah, blah. Well, yes, but what about adding in the present value of future tax receipts? And, you know, I think this is a very, it's a very dubious exercise, I think. You know, if you wanted to do a full balance sheet of the public sector, fine, do one. But I think it should be full. Um, I mean, I suspect this is just another one of those problems. It's not the only one. There's other demographic issues that relate to what um, we were saying earlier on about the long-term prospects of the public finances as part of all that. But more generally, the point I want to make is, are public sector pensions too generous? Answer, there's no double-handed economist this. Answer, yes, much too generous. I mean, hugely too generous. Um, and this is going to be politically going to be a very, very difficult thing to tackle, I'm afraid, because as we know what's been happening is in the private sector, um, the old gold plated pension schemes, which so many people are not just sort of senior executives, but ordinary workers too used to get, they've been on the way out now for quite a long time. Meanwhile, in the public sector, there hasn't been a real challenge to the old system. So there's a bit of a public private dichotomy here. And how a government brings itself to tackle that, I really don't know. Roger, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us this afternoon. Absolutely fascinating discussion um, between you and Mike. And thank you as well, Mike. But um, thank you, Roger, for taking the time. And for everyone watching, don't forget Roger's book, The AI Economy, available now, Amazon, all good bookshops, definitely worth buying. And thank you um, to you all for attending and for supporting the Taxpayers Alliance. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, share the link around with your friends and colleagues and make sure they do too um after you've bought roger's book of course but in the meantime um i'd like to bid you all good afternoon and thank you for joining us mm -hmm.